uh, hello everyone welcome back to the channel and today we have with us michael and dylan from chess lifestyle one of the best chess channels i have ever seen hey everyone it's 4am editing michael here and today uh, you're going to watch an interview given by a budding chess youtuber called ashir um, he has his own channel called Chess In, uh, link in the description, and yeah, uh, he's a great guy. I thought the interview was a lot of fun, so hopefully you'll enjoy. So, the two of you, how did you guys meet and how did this chess lifestyle all start, this entire idea of starting a YouTube channel? Ooh. So, uh, Michael and I met at the UCL Chess Society, and UCL is the University College of London. Um, and as you can probably hear from my accent, I'm not uh, English, I'm American. And so I was studying, um, I'm, I was studying fine art at, uh, at UCL, at the Slade School of Fine Art, and uh, Michael was studying biochemistry? Yeah, molecular biology, like same, same kind of stuff. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, but we would both uh, obviously opt to study, uh, to get a master's in chess if that was an option. Uh, <laughs> so we spent a lot, of, a lot of time outside of our studies uh, in the chess club and being, being active, organizing events, um, we were officers in, in the society and yeah, we even started our own uh, chess league. So we've been <clears throat> partnered up on a lot of stuff uh, even before we started a YouTube channel. Right. And then really for YouTube, um, that all started um, just at the start of this whole like pandemic. Like I think around like April, we were like sorting out logistics, like in terms of getting a logo, uh, trying to think of like what kind of brand or target audience we're aiming for. I mean, I think around May, we actually got started with uploading and it was really our first time both like video editing and actually, no, I, that's a lie. I have done some uh, YouTube stuff in the past. Um, okay. I had I had a really old channel called Chess Scrubs, but it was really, it was really botched. Like I didn't edit any of the videos. It was just like I would stream them on a really bad laptop and then just like upload those streams but some of them some of them like um were really popular and like actually yeah, got quite I've a few seen some of them yeah nice <laughs> yeah no they're not too bad actually. title mm -hmm. um so uh dylan you are currently uh, as well as doing your own chess you're working at an office job and michael you are also <clears throat> tutoring students at chess right that is correct so the two of you, how do you guys manage to make time for chess? You know, you have, I mean, unlike me, you're not a high school student who has tons of time on his hand. You guys have work to do. So how do you manage time for your own chess? Okay, so for me, um, to be honest, like teaching my students, that all still feels like chess to me. So it's like, it's very convenient because a lot of, I, I've got very mixed range of students actually. Like um, I, I generally teach kids between uh, the ages of, well, I, I would have said seven to around 11, but I've actually started teaching a four-year-old girl who is very, very sharp and very, very quick. So that's very exciting. Um, but yeah, around like ages of seven to 10 and um, actually quite a few of them now are getting really, really strong. Like I have one who's like uh, beats me in blitz half the time. So it's, it's really promising to see. And because of that, I can actually use a lot of the training material I work on in my free time to actually use in the lessons. So not only am I like improving my own chest, but I'm actually, um, I don't know, practicing the lessons that have, I don't know, stuck with me or I'm learning. So by teaching it, it really makes it clear in my head. And they normally ask some really good questions. Um, and that helps me build my knowledge. So to be it's honest, all selfish, like, selfish motivation. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I mean, no, no, no. I think, I think, um, yeah, luckily with my job, um, I, I really, I really love my students and I get a lot of satisfaction from seeing them like, uh, get better and do well in tournaments and yeah, the more questions they ask the better. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think it all ties in together so i'm lucky in the sense that i don't just have to separate my work and mm -hmm. chess i can just kind of merge it all together and that's good so you're saying it merges you know combines together and complements each other complements exactly exactly yeah yeah i have a similar um similar experience in that my client are both fortunate enough to have uh, chess related um employment ah okay uh, i didn't know that yeah i'm i actually work for chessable 
uh, as ah, a okay. content editor. So I'm constantly um, surrounded by by chess material. Not that I, oh. I get the, the the opportunity to absorb most of the material because it's sort of a more technical job, um, and I don't really have time to to really train it in the same way. So uh, making time for my own chess training is a separate matter, and it, it can be difficult at times, but. Um, yeah, it, it's good to have uh, a training partner in Michael and um, some friends who have the same motivation to improve. Um, yeah, I, I, I keep a tight calendar and I try to plan ahead when I'll have time to study and what I'll study and just try to stick to it. That's great. So both of you actually have very chess lifestyles, true to your channel name. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we'd be lying to our own, you know, viewers, right? If, if we weren't really yeah. living the just lifestyle. So, very true, yeah. very true. Um, So both of you now, you guys are both, well, um, although you could say the chess training does complement each other, you're not completely focused on your own chess when you are teaching. You are mainly focused on how your students are working. And same goes for Dylan. Your job is more technical. So do you think it's possible in the long term, maybe five, ten years from now, to continue living the current lifestyle that you're le leading and still probably make grandmaster or maybe more who knows i don't ah. know about grandmaster that's <laughs> that's not really on my radar right now <laughs> uh not even having a title at all but <clears throat> okay then the same master level master level freedom yeah master. yeah i think it's it's um it's definitely in the scope of my ability to reach fm at some point in the distant future hopefully. yeah honestly like i like the hypothetical question i mean for me i never considered doing exactly what I'm doing right now for the next five, 10 years, because I know as a, as a person, I, I'm very volatile in terms of like what I like to do and when I like to do it. And I'm always looking for change. Like, to be honest, even five years ago, chess was not a priority at all. And like, I don't know, I was more focused on my studies and I didn't really care about chess. It's funny, like in the first year of university, I, d I hardly did any chess. And all of my friends like didn't even like know really I played chess or I like, didn't really care and like, I didn't really care. Um, I was like doing all these other things. And then like by the end of university, like really chess was definitely up there. And like, I think I most never of... knew pre-chess Michael. <laughs> yeah, I never knew a pre-chess Michael. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I don't know. Um, five years is a long time. But honestly, I'm so immersed in chess right now. Like I think this lifestyle could be good enough to get me to like um, GM given like my current work ethic towards towards chess. Like maybe like um, not me personally, but anyone else who had a similar kind of <clears throat> regime where I don't know, they had a few students every day, but had a lot of free time to just train. And I think that's the important thing because often if you have like a full-time job, you know, you also need some time to hang out with friends. You need some time to yourself to like and do other hobbies you need and then that leaves only very little time to do chess but i've got so much free time that i can actually you know have a lot of time for chess as well as like you know living in like <laughs> a decent human's life as well so yeah i think i think like it, re it really does work and like anyone like um pursuing like um a title you know you've got to make money some way and i honestly think like tutoring is a really good uh way to balance that life because you know it makes a lot of money but normally the hours aren't too many but if you can get by on like um the money you can make from those hours then you know that gives you a lot of free time to like actually pursue other stuff like i don't know trying to improve your chess yeah i think you're a good example of the fact that it can be done because you're living in london of all places you're mm -hmm. yeah. living, you know a london cost of living which is right wonderful. right very central as well so yeah um uh, as for the longevity of of, um, of chess for me, I think um, there are some other factors that come into play, like the fact that I'm on a visa in the UK where I'm supposed to be making mm. art to sort of contribute to the humanities. That's sort of the condition of my visa. Um, and that's what I went to school for. So I want to stay active in my art and my own practice. Um, Can you count so chess as an art? I have that whole other side of things <laughs> going on. What would you say? Can you count chess as an art? Just like play some beautiful sick like queen sacrifice <laughs> and just be like yep this is this i mean is i personally do but i don't think i could make that case to the to right the kvi visa and immigration team sure sure mm -hmm. um yeah but i i don't have any plans to slow down in the the foreseeable future in terms of chess like i have pretty um pretty strong ambitions and goals 
That's great. That's great. Um, Dylan, can I focus on you for a second? So you've just moved to Brighton, isn't it? Yep. So could you talk a bit more about why you chose to move to Brighton and why not stay in the United States, you know, for chess? Because as it seems, at least to us in India, that chess is starting to go on kind of a boom in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got the St. Louis Chess Club. I actually lived in St. Louis for mm -hmm. for a year, year and a half, um, right next to the club. In fact, I could walk there in, in five minutes. Wow. Uh, it was amazing. I uh, played in several events there. I got to attend the U.S. Chess Championships, Singfield Cup, and all that kind of stuff. And um, I met several of the the world's best players. It was great. Um, but I chose Brighton because uh, it's cheaper than London. Um, the reason I moved back to the UK, uh, first of all, is because I, I was awarded this visa. It's called a Global Talent Visa for my art. <clears throat> I had to fulfill certain criteria, like having exhibited in so many shows, having um, like media appearances and um, have strong um, references. And so I, I have a lot of friends here. I made a lot of friends here from from chess and art, and it's a great art scene. So um, I also have I also really like traveling and I want to do more traveling in Europe. So uh, I figured if I don't take this opportunity, I'll, I might not ever get a chance like this again. So um, I definitely wanted to move back to the UK. But as for Brighton, uh, several of my friends recommended uh, Brighton in particular because it's super artsy and progressive um, and it's beautiful. It's um, the south coast of, of England, right on the mm -hmm. sea. I'm, I live like 15 minutes walk away from the water. It's gorgeous. And uh, yeah, I love everything about it so far. So uh, in Brighton, are you in tier one? Uh, on a, the visa, you mean? Uh, no, in, in the area of Brighton. Tier one, what do you mean? Okay, maybe I've gotten confused. <laughs> no, um, uh, let's just ignore I mentioned that. <laughs> <laughs> the only tiers I know of are like COVID protocol tiers. Uh, yeah, I, yeah okay. like tiers, I don't think it's used to describe location in the UK. Yeah, that, that never happened. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, the power okay. of editing, we can always like... Yeah. <laughs> <snip>. <laughs> okay, um, guys, predictions for the World Championship. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go fast. Uh, I, I, I would love... Um, Mm, this is this is a good question. Well, firstly, I, I'm really excited for the match because, after all, Nepomniachtchi is Magnus's childhood rival, and mm -hmm. in any kind of like underdog, like like I don't know sports, anime, like whatever, imagine the childhood rival coming up to face is Gary his, to, like, who is Ash. Uh, sorry, yeah. if you know that reference, he, he's he's Ash's Gary. Oh, Ashley's Gary, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so I just think that, first of all, the whole premise is amazing. And I, I love the fact that it's Russia against um, anyone else, because like mm -hmm. I feel like Russia really, really takes it seriously. And they're going to train Nepo to the max to make sure they've like covered every single like tiny um, ounce of weakness that Magnus might have. So I think it's going to be really exciting in that regard. And I, I look forward to that. But ultimately, I still think Magnus is such a beast. And when it when it comes to such an important match, like he will go 100% as well. And a Magnus on 100% is pretty damn scary. <laughs> so I think maybe if Nepo had a bit more experience, I'd be a bit more confident. But I do have to say, for me, Magnus clinches it in terms of predictions. But I do think most people are like... Um, I don't know, uh, what's the right word? They're not giving Nepo a fair chance. Like I see like statistics yeah. online and it's like, oh yeah, Nepo is like 10, 15% chance. Like, I think that's bullshit. Like, ne yeah. like if Nepo gets in shape, like he's never really got like super in shape for chess. He's always like, I don't know, he's even got like almost professional Dota, I'm pretty sure. And just like, I don't know, again, like in his like twenties, like he chess, he wasn't even training chess. Like he's had a lot of time off. And now he's had this opportunity. I think we're gonna see like a new a new level to his play. Given the he's yeah. gonna go super sane. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I, I I've seen the bet makers, the big bet makers. I think are giving him now like slowly increasing chance, but there's still he's still down at like twenty five percent chance to win or something like that. So it's like three to one, uh, Magnus. 
um, which I still think is a little low. I think we're going to see decisive games on like the last couple. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I think the, the most like intriguing statistic about like what something that might give uh, Nepo a chance is that um, in the last two uh, world championship matches, Magnus um, has won a total of one game, one, one game in, in both matches. Um, he's won in both tie breaks. Um, yeah. So I, th I think the fact that Nepo might not be the underdog in a tie break in the same way that, um, that Karyakin and Karawana are, uh, that makes for a really interesting, um, maybe new level of pressure for Magnus, not to feel like he is safe to just draw the whole, the whole way through. Um, and yeah, I, I think he might even have the best shot of, of the previous three candidates. I just have a question. Actually, I can throw this at Isha, but okay. you know, what what do you think? Um, like, the, like, do you think Nepa would make a good world champion in terms of like uh, publicity for chess and uh, progress from there? Definitely. I mean, he's a very you know interesting character. So definitely, from a publicity point of view, it'd be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. My only concern with Nepo is his mood. You know, the day he's in a good you know, right. he's in a good mood, he's gonna play great, but. When he's in a bad mood, he, he can't really keep the balance. You know, he's very imbalanced. You know, one right. day he'll win, the next day he'll lose. It's just, I don't think he can win too many tournaments like that. That's my only concern with him. Right, I think right. He's probably the best <clears throat> challenger for Magnus, mm -hmm. but I'm not so sure if he can, maybe he can beat Magnus in one tournament. Can he do it in two tournaments, three tournaments in a row? That's where right. I have my doubts. <clears throat> But right. for one World Championship match, I would probably give Nepo like a 40-45% chance of winning this. Right. Of winning. Of winning, You gotta winning, consider yeah. the draw chance too. Ah, yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. Okay, let's say... Um, I'd say Magnus has a pretty solid chance of winning. So I'd say 50% Magnus wins, 35% mm -hmm. Nepo wins, and 15% mm -hmm. it's a draw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fair. So I, I think that's kind of balanced at least. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's okay. well. I mean, someone has to win, I guess. Uh, yeah. May maybe you maybe you can't factor in the draw. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> someone has to win the world championship. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, guys, the strongest chess player who's never become world champion. I made two videos on this, and the first one I got a lot of stick from people for not including some names. So I'd like to see <laughs> if any new names come up. You know, so who do who do you guys think are the strongest players who've never become world champion? You want us to come up with new names, or you or you can just name honest? anyone, okay. anyone, literally. Just no, give one guy, just one guy. One guy. Korchnoi. Korchnoi, okay. Korchnoi is Korchnoi is the go-to, but I I I'm always skeptical of Korchnoi. Like I swear to God, like I look at any classical games, and it's always Korchnoi making like some terrible positional <laughs> blunder and getting destroyed. Like I I've yet to see like. The incredible side of culture. I think a lot of the games I saw were when he was past his peak. So probably I should just, you know, <laughs> train some more chess and like actually see the, the good side of Coach Mike. Also, uh, for me, Dylan has hung. Oh no, okay, he's back. That's good. Um Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I left for some reason. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Um Best player. I mean like objectively it would have to be someone like Caruana who okay. like you know if he was I don't know in any <clears throat> previous one championship I know like currently we have many more resources to improve but I think just given the current standard of chess and how competitive it really is I think people take for granted how strong Magnus actually is and I think the competitors would have had their chance at like a title had they been anywhere near that strength like i don't know i, I think the question assumes it. that we're supposed to take their player in the context of their day though that is true that is true that's also fair yeah but okay i'll, I'll give carolina as my interesting answer i don't know yeah no i uh, if wondering about good korchner games there's a game korchner it's pasky i don't remember the year but he was playing white and there was some back rank brilliancy maybe h3 at some point it was a very nice game you check it out okay mm. cool uh, i'll make a note Okay, that was uh, that was the question. The strongest chess player who never became world champion. Now, you guys, um, if there's somebody who is starting out with chess, what is the one advice you would give them right now? Okay, oh, I, I want to give two pieces of advice, but the, the, the first piece would just be like 
have complete fun with it. Don't like over stress about, oh, I need to study this, study that, and then get really stressed and I end up like hating chess because at, like if you're just starting, there is so much to learn and so much enjoyment you can get from the game. It's like even myself having like studied for a long time, I'm still feeling like there's so many interesting aspects to learn from. And I think it's only once you really hit like GM where the grind gets really tough and might become a bit more laborious and a bit boring to like try and improve. Maybe I haven't got there yet, so I don't really know. So yeah, number one would just be have fun. And number two, I think this is super underrated, but really never, ever, ever, ever give up in your games. Even if you are a bishop down, even if you're a rook down, even if you're like five pawns, a queen, a knight, and whatever down, you always fight on and you would be surprised. And num- like, I almost have a reputation of winning lost endgames. I, I probably do actually, like from-, from my university days, like whatever tournament I would be in, I would have, let's say, I don't know, uh, knight and rook versus queen. And I'd end up mating the guy. Like when your opponent is beating you, they slack off in the majority of people. They slack off, they feel like they've worked hard to gain their advantage. And then they're just like, they're just chilling. And it's the worst thing you can do because your opponent who is worse is going to try even harder to bounce back if they've got fighting spirit. And I definitely have that fighting spirit. So like, if I'm worse in the position, I'm going to be giving everything to like, make sure I regain the initiative and take the game over. And yeah, so I, I think that's that's the number one important thing. And you'll also learn a lot more from not agreeing draws, from not uh, resigning early. Like, play for stalemates. Like, who who cares about respect? It's like, you know, we're, we're playing chess to play chess, like, not to end the game early and, like, I don't know, go home and watch football or whatever, like, people do. So, yeah, like, play, play to the end. Did you see that Magnus was watching um, Real Madrid uh, while playing yeah. the? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really. <laughs> I, I haven't seen that. And clip he still won. Way. He still won both games against the. Yeah, Cavs. amazing, amazing, it's crazy. Okay, Tomofi. unless you're Magnus, then never give up. Yeah, <laughs> if you're Magnus, you can do everything. So, yeah. um, so I have two pieces of advice: one along the lines of improvement, and one along the lines of, uh, just not losing enjoyment in the game. Um, I'll start with that one. It's uh, find. Uh, chess friends or at least one chess friend who you can um, play with look at uh, games and puzzles with and um, I'm not even saying it has to be a training partner like some people might not want to train chess might just be a casual activity but having another uh, friend in chess to share your experiences with is um, the best way to stay um, interested I think Um, and at the same time, if you are going to take it seriously, it's the best way to sort of um, put a level of responsibility on yourself to, you know, <clears throat> and especially if you're a competitive person at any level, you can um, use that to fuel uh, some kind of like friendly rivalry and mm. improve that way. Um, the second piece of advice is um, similar to what Michael said is not accept, uh, don't accept draws or offer draws, uh, even in <clears throat> okay, like if you're in a really important like tournament game situ- match mm-hmm. situation and you need a draw to like clinch it, and that's different, but it's generally not what we're talking about. Um, in any other circumstance, I don't like my personal policy is uh, not, not to offer uh, or accept draws because you just won't learn as much that way. Um, just simply if uh, the game continues longer, you're going to learn more. So, very fair. Yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, Dylan, <clears throat> thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys a few quick fire questions. You guys, rapid fire rather. So you guys have just got a first thing in your mind, spit it out. Okay. Oh God. Michael, <laughs> would you rather play the modern Benoni or the Bong Cloud? Oh modern Benoni. <laughs> Easy. That's his, that's his repertoire. <clears throat> okay. I hope I Dylan, get one like that. Uh, would you like to be a grandmaster or a millionaire? Grandmaster. Okay. Michael, a chess book that everyone should read. Um, Jakob Argard, Excelling at Chess, Positional Play. Aha, I've read that book. It's a good one. Yeah. Um, Dylan, the best chess advice you ever got? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Probably wasn't the best rapid fire question, so I'll give you some time to think on it. (laughs) Dylan, you flagged. You've run out of time. (laughs) 
<laughs> you lose the game. Yeah. I think Dylan is also hung. <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the question just took him out. It was, it was too, it was too deep. Yeah, <laughs> he's just, he's just stuck in, stuck in time now. Um, An interesting post to stop on though. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. <laughs> it, maybe, maybe Dylan's not actually frozen. You know, he's, he's just pretending to like buy himself some time, I and mean, then he's. Yeah, that would be now. really fun. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Welcome back. <laughs> Did I just leave it again? What was that? Yeah. Yeah. You just cut out. And it was in a really you're you're in an interesting thinking pose as well. So we weren't sure if you were just like pretending. I think I, I think Dylan's frozen again. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Dylan, sorry to put you back in the spotlight, but what's the best chess advice you ever got? Oh god. Um <laughs> I can't pass. We don't have any passes. I think we should each get one pass. Okay. Fair enough. You got one pass. Okay. 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 We'll move to Michael then. Michael, I'm sorry again. I know this is an impossible question, but I'm still gonna ask it because yep. I'm not the one who's gonna have to answer it. Yep. Uh, Gary Kasparov or Magnus Carlsen? Magnus. Magnus. Just. Okay. Just. Just. Okay. Dylan, Alexander Ayakin or Jose Raul Capablanca? Capablanca all day. <laughs> yeah, probably. <clears throat> probably. To be fair, probably. Yeah. Michael, chess. Or shogi. Oh no, I have to say chess. We're on a chess yeah. chess overall, but shogi has some really underrated points. But that'll take a longer answer. Okay, fair enough. So it's chess in the end. Yep, chess, chess. Dylan, would you rather play the opening or the middle game? Middle game. Middle game. Okay, Michael, teaching chess or studying chess? Studying, studying, studying. Your students won't be watching this, will they? <laughs> no, they will be. <laughs> Michael's coming okay, in right today. Uh, it's too late. It's too late. They've seen enough embarrassing sides of me, like, you know, well, what to do, what to do. <laughs> okay, guys. If there was one thing you could say right now, like at the very end of this, you know, some conclusive statement, some which you can look back at, you know, 10 years later and be like, you know, that was a profound thing to say. So one thing you guys would say right now, which you can, you know, look back and be like, you know, I was quite smart, something like that. Okay. I would say... Keep going with the flow. Uh, say yes to everything. Like if some uh, random kid called Ishir messages you on Discord, say yes. Be like, yo, let's do this meeting. Like keep your options open. Um, never feel like you're stuck into one loop of doing one thing all the time. Just like go with the flow, say yes to everything and good things will happen. Lead the Michael lifestyle. Ex yeah, the chess lifestyle, the chess lifestyle. <laughs> He proposed that that be the name, but I, I had to veto it. <laughs> yeah, the Michael lifestyle. <laughs> Starring Michael and Dylan. <laughs> Something profound. Uh, does it have to be chess related? No, it doesn't have to be. Anything. Um, everything is relative. Okay. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I swear, wait, wait, which famous dude said that? Is that, is that like Einstein? Einstein, or something? yeah, I thought yeah. so too. I don't, I mean, I'm sure lots of people said it like, <laughs> yeah, no, and someone's the one who gives some kind of pretty girl sitting next to you to our kind of relation. I don't just like mean that. in like a physics context, I mean in like uh -huh. a context, like a moral, uh, ethical context. Um, yeah, art, chess, um, perception, existence. Fair enough, guys. I had a lot of fun yeah. doing this. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Oh, I loved it. Thank you. Thank you, Asher. <laughs> And yeah, sure. big shout out to Ashir because like his content is like, I don't know, I, I watched like the, I watched a few videos now, but I watched, the first one I watched was like the 24 hours uh, in uh, Caruana's lifestyle. It was so mm. fun. It was so yeah, fun. that's the first one I watched too. That, that, was, <laughs> that was the one that attracted me. Yeah. Glad you liked it, guys. And I had a lot of fun. I hope the viewers also got something out of, out of this. Thank you for coming on, guys. Nope, no problem. See you around. <laughs> See you around.